Hi, this is Tavi Greiner, Astronomy.fm's Vice President of Communications. If you enjoy our programming, please let us know with a donation to astronomy.fm slash donate. We really do rely on your support, and it's true. Every little bit counts. AFM. Program complete. Enter when ready. The curtain of night is drawn back. The telescopes are trained. The domes are open. The audience is set. Now, step into the event horizon. Three. Chat room will open. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the event horizon here on astronomy.fm radio. It is Friday evening, May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. 2018, 9 o'clock in the evening for those of us here in the eastern portion of North America, Universal Time, 1 o'clock in the morning, May the 5th, Saturday morning. That means we are now live for the next hour. Come on over <clears throat> and join us in the chat room. Go to the homepage, astronomy.fm. Look where it says radio chat. Click on that. Type in a name. Skip the password. Hit login. And you'll be here joining the crowd. Got you, um, you Nick, uh, me. Am I, am I still in the chat room? You're still in the chat room, yes. Got okay. Glenn, Black Projects, Fred Hopper. Welcome, everybody. Of course, plenty, plenty more room for everybody to come on over and join us. If you have any questions for us, you can ask right online. That's and, uh, the chat room. <laughs> right in the chat room. Yeah, right in, right in the chat room there. We'll answer those questions live for you. Or we'll just think about them for a while. And maybe not. Well, yeah, come on over and ask the questions. Marcy, you can always make up answers as you go, if you like. You know like, that, don't you? This is, Lucy, this is the event horizon. Lucy Let's from Fairly it. Brown, yes. Uh, if if, if Narlock was here, it, it would be whatever came across his mind in that particular moment. Exactly. Well, it's <laughs> it's all black holes. You know, it's all done with black holes. Oh yes, we're doing ultra spaghettification. Mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of like a line from Chevy Chase that said, "Ball bearings. It's all done with ball bearings these days." I can't remember what that movie was. I don't know, roller blade or something, or roller dog. Mm-hmm. He was playing a airline airplane mechanic. As, but that wasn't his job, so hmm, like a spy movie or something like that. I don't remember. I, uh, spy movie. Oh, well, that wasn't one of those. Uh, oh yeah, I've been logged out. Uh, it wasn't one of those ne- uh, Nielsen films, was it? You know, like uh, oh, and uh, could could be, could be. I can't quite remember. I'll we'll have to figure it out. I Spy, possibly. Mm, no, before then. Before then, because movie I, before kn- I yeah. know that. The original I Spy. Uh-huh. Uh, and, so like oh, that. probably says Fletch. Um, the original team. Fletch is it, I think. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Conrad. I think they did make it to a TV movie. I don't think they actually made it to the cinema. I know that there was a cover version done for the cinema of I Spy. Yeah. I think who's it was. Who's in Will, that? Was it, that? Smith, I think, was something. Was it Bill Cosby in the original I Spy? Uh, Ro- Robert Culp? Robert Culp, I believe. Uh, let's see. I can't remember. I spy TV. <laughs> there you go. Okay, TV series. Uh, Robert Culp and Bill Crosby. Yep. Play That's traveling it. undercover as international tennis bums. Mm-hmm. Robinson posed as the amateur, with uh, Scott being the pro, I guess, or the okay. trainer. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen that show in a long time. Oh, no. It's been, oh, God. Where else have we seen? Mod Squad, um, The Prisoner. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, God. There's been a lot of shows that haven't been seen. Wild Wild West. There you go. Wild Wild West. <laughs> Glenn. <laughs> we won't say it on air, Glenn, but yeah, that was funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. The movie, the movie was uh, Eddie Murphy and o- Owen Wilson. See, yeah. if you come over to the chat room, everybody, you get the inside jokes that way. Yeah, it, it does help. Yeah. Um, I want to say hello to everybody um, down in Brazil because there is actually a astrophysics class starting up. Uh, and a couple of my Facebook friends are actually in that class. Just bear me for a second so I can... Mm-hmm. Nice. You know, I, you know, I, you know, I missed again. What's that? Neef, 
NAFE, Northeastern yeah, Astronomy yeah. Forum. I, I missed it too. Did you? And that's closer for you. Yeah, but I just can't. Well, it's a case of really, I'm just too bleh weekend. I, I know, it's just like, okay, it's so just this, hard to get there. Shout out to my friends in uh, Santa Paulo. Um, and Santa or San? Sa- Santos or Sao Paulo. Uh, Sao Mexico, Paulo. Paulo, Brazil. Uh, Sao Paulo, okay. Which there is Sao Paulo. Anyway, apparently Professor Alexander Zabot is uh, getting ready to lead off a general astrophysics course in the local university there. So, hey guys, if you're listening, good luck, enjoy, and let's see how soon you can out- outdo Alex Fipanenko. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I thought I'd just give them a shout out. Um, Southern skies. I haven't seen Southern skies since 1994, I think it was. Uh, the last time I saw Southern skies was two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, live, you were down there? Uh, it was a live image of the Southern skies. No, I mean live, being down live. there. It was live. You were there, actually? Uh, I was actually log- logged into um, Siding Springs. Yeah. I was actually looking. Uh, it was just one of those nights where I just there was nothing of real interest to, to capture my to make me want to take an image. So I just had the all sky up and uh, just sitting there watching the LM, LMC and uh, everything else just creeping across the sky. That big brand, that big band of um, lovely light, um, so In nicely the protected by. Way. Uh, see, the cosmic emu and a few of the other things. Cosmic emu. Yeah. Okay. You got to remember the Australian astronomers um, actually do use the uh, Aboriginal um, constellations. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, I think uh, my friend Jen um, in Swan Hill regularly. Well, the Swan Hill group regularly referring refer to the emu. I know that the people on the uh, New Zealand astronomy group. Um, they they refer to it as well. So yeah, it is kind of nice to um, use these alternate definitions for the constellations, and, and it, I suppose it does really have a good practical use. Mm-hmm. If, if you are teaching astronomy in, in the outback um, in the classes, there a lot of the a lot of the kids taking the class will be Aboriginal, and I think it's only right and proper that uh, their designations. Mm-hmm are used in preference to the western ones mm-hmm. sometimes when I travel I like to, if I can get to a, a planetarium, I like to go and, and see their shows but what I really prefer is their live sky show yeah. not one of the canned shows, I remember being somewhere in the UK and they played a, a pre-recorded show which was actually produced in the US and since I was working in the planetarium at the same t- at the time I actually knew that show and I said, well, if the sound goes out, I can narrate the rest of the show for you because I've got it so, so memorized. I was like, <laughs> I don't want that kind of show. I want local flavor. You know, so if it's uh, – uh, and, and even if it's in their own country's language, that's good for me too. Uh, I'll pick up what I can pick up out of it, but I don't want, a, you know, a canned program that I've already heard before. I want something that's, you know, like you said, like uh, local culture constellations – and the names and impressions of things and how they describe them, and local culture, too. I prefer that when I'm traveling around. I'm going to chuck this link in. Since you did the, the May the 4th Be With You, I thought this is uh, something that Black Project shared with me earlier today. Um, okay. So, May the 4th Be With You if you found yourself fighting, facing down an Imperial TIE fighter. it does. One, if you look at the picture, it does kind of look like the center of this spiral galaxy. It's UGC... 6093 beautiful spiral arms spiral arms that swirl away from the fighter shaped bar of stars crossing the galaxy's core so there you go there's something to think about there you go so and of course I, i've got uh, the fourth doctor um on, on my facebook page for the fourth and i have the fifth and sixth doctors for the next two days there you go so so, so it's may the fourth be with you and may the fourth doctor be be with you or something. I don't okay, know. let's see. Let's see. Let's see if I can get this to work. Um, and I'll, I'll see if I can put a link into the picture. Okay. So, but as I say, it's Star Wars Day, folks. So I think we're going to have to just, <laughs> just look. Yeah. I've I've lost track of the sci-fi movies, the Star Wars series. The last one I remember was somebody handing Luke a lightsaber on the 
top of a hill or something like that. Now, is that is there a movie after that? Uh, the last one was um, when the the return of the not the return of the Jedi. It's the one where um, well, I'm not, I'm not going to spoil it because I don't, I want people to go buy the DVD and Blu-ray. Um, but he actually does make an appearance in most of the movie. Oh, most of it. Okay. Yeah, this was the only one he appeared at the end of the movie. So there must be one after that then. Yes, there is another one, and it's out there. And it's, I think it's just finished running in the in the cinemas. Okay. So I'm not going to spoil it for people, anybody who has not seen it. So anyway, th- 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 that is the uh, picture that I have on my Facebook at the moment. And I have one for the fifth Doctor and the other baker, Colin, uh, for the sixth. There you go. So, since we're not going to be here, um, let's, because I say, it's up there. I, I will put links into chat. They're still the, producing uh, new Doctor Who shows, right? Audio advance, in, in audio, yes. And just in audio? Just in audio, yes. Not, not in video? So they stopped recently then? Well, what has happened is the last Doctor Who changed from a guy to a woman. Oh, that's right. I remember hearing that. Yes. Um, there was a, a, an appearance of the first Doctor. Okay. Uh, I, I'm told that uh, the person who imp- who did the first Doctor was very good. I'm probably gonna I'm probably gonna watch it. Um, I, I've always been of the opinion if it's canon, it can't uh, um, change sexes. But uh, everybody's telling me this is this is the new Doctor Who, and he can do what he wants. I'm saying, mm-hmm. well, there ain't Doctor Who then. Doctor Who is cheesy sets, good stories, and uh, something you can let your four year old watch and not really worry about what they're being told so that that's just my view of it oh, okay then i'll tell you a joke after the show <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as i say there is another one coming out um and the thing is the next one that's coming out is may 25th it's solo it's all about han solo it's a solo a star wars story. oh that's right i think i remember hearing about that it looks pretty good now yeah okay i i, I last weekend i was at the cinemas i was in the RPX, watching Infinity Wars. Um, it was good fun. Mm-hmm. Now, Absolutely. a little more, little more astronomy-wise, have you seen the new Lost in Space? Yes. I, I started watching it, and then I stopped. <laughs> ah. I, I got as far as them crash-landing on the planet, uh, the, the Jupiter 2 taking a massive hit and crash-landing. Okay. That's as far as I've got so far. All right. I haven't seen it. So that happens, and they all die? Ah, oh, end of the show. No. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah, got to write it a little farther than that. Yeah, maybe I'll actually get uh, Netflix and actually watch that. So. Well, I have Netflix. In fact, uh, I guess I don't. I'll write it to Blu-ray because um, I like Blu-ray. I, I've got most of uh, Stargate Atlantis. On, I've got Stargate Atlantis on Blu-ray. My Andromeda's on Blu-ray. My classic Star Trek is on Blu-ray. Okay. Um. So, yeah, I'm getting into it, and I, I really like the quality. Um, I think the thing for me is I can, I can see the difference between standard definition and mm-hmm. 1030, sorry, 1080i. <laughs> oh, Nick Glenn saying, uh, next Marty will try to kill off Picard. That's funny. Which reminds me of when I was in Vegas, I was almost 20 years ago now, they had a Star Trek um, uh, casino. Mm. Off, off the main strip, more like in town, and went there. It was actually pretty cool. They had a lot of, uh, well, they had a, a, like a simulation ride. Uh, they had a lot of memorabilia from all the shows. So as you're, you're you know, queued up in line to go into the simulator, um, there's all the uniforms and phasers and radios and, and stuff like that. So that's actually pretty cool stuff from there. I remember the theme of the, of the show, though, was that... Um, somebody, you know, in, in the time now was actually an ancestor of Picard. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like one of these, everybody's thinking, oh, maybe it's me, maybe it's me. And those little kids raise his head, it's me, it's me. So, and then the the thing goes on where these, the, I think it must be Klingons or something like that. They said, okay, we're back from the, we're back from the future. We're going to kill the relative of Picard. And everybody points at the little kid. So not not Paradox. a good thing. Yeah, not a good thing to be. Like he wants to be the you know the, the relative of Picard, and then he doesn't want to be the relative of Picard since they came back in time to kill him. So. 
Well, yeah, that was fun. As I say, it was a good thing. I, I, ha- I have issues with Patrick Stewart, um, mm. mainly because um, he actually stood up at a convention and says, I don't think we should be going into space. Um, and you can imagine, you can imagine the reaction. Now, a lot of people got into astronomy, astrophysics because of Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Um, they liked what they saw. They liked the idea of Roddenberry's future, where um, it's a case where every, no matter what your nationality looks are, you you're an equally valid member of the crew. Um, now, yeah, I know everybody had a lot of people had issues originally in, with Plato's stepchildren with Kirk kissing Uhura. Um, but uh, the thing is, Star Trek did a lot of good. It got the, a lot of people excited about science. All the crew was equal unless you were a security officer with a red shirt. <laughs> if you were a red shirt, period. <laughs> unless, of course, you're Scotty and Uhura, or That's you have right. your own personal deflector shields. <laughs> <nobody kills> you. <laughs> That's right. However, she did get reduced to a cube once. Uhura did? Yes. Mm. The Kelvins boarded the Enterprise and hijacked uh, it. Okay. Aqua, yes, we still talk about Star Trek occasionally. Actually, saying that, if you really want a Star Trek experience, you need to come to Lake George in New York because they have the most accurate set for Star Trek ever from the original for the original Enterprise. In fact, James Crowley, who's actually an Elvis impersonator, uh, was producing fan flick um, Star Trek episodes on the web, and he had a visit from Margell Barrett Roddenberry and Eugene. Roddenberry Jr., and they were imp- dead impressed with the accuracy. In fact, several of the guys who worked on the original Star Trek um, sets visited, and they, they couldn't believe just how accurate all his stuff was. And mm. he said, well, how did you get it? He says, well, some pieces I actually got because he saw stuff that was being junked or being offered, he grabbed it. The original sets, as Glenn quite rightly points out, um, no longer exist, but the ones that uh, James Crowley built are considered to be the most accurate going. They are they are extremely um, correct. Uh, mm-hmm. if, if you are if you were working on the series, apparently the guy says we can't believe how well you've done it. In fact, you, you when you were doing your, some of the effects were kind of like, wow, I wish we could have done that mm-hmm. because if you remember from Space Seed, Khan is reading. Uh, a manual, and when they originally did the shot, the screen's blank. But when it, when the camera pans round to what he's reading, suddenly you've got the schematic. So what they've had to do, they had to um, project. I think they had to project it in uh, as a special, as a CGI, as a, as a very crude effect. Mm. Whereas when Crowley was doing it, um, it was he was using state of the art CGI. In mm. fact, the main screen he has for the bridge set. Um, is considered to be he, his starscape, his star fields are so accurate um, that the guys were really. He says, "How did you do that?" He says, "I actually have the biggest high definition TV I could get my hands on, and that's yeah. the Enterprise's main view screen." Mm-hmm. So yeah, we can actually put um, images. So when, when Kirk is looking and talking to the Klingons or the Romulans on the screen, we've actually put them into the screen you're actually mm-hmm. seeing them on the screen ah, okay it's that good ah nice um obviously and i know that bill shatner wasn't too crazy about the redone special effects with modern cgi i personally i like because i've got the blu-ray set i've got them i like them mm-hmm. i like the fact that the phases now track the object they're they're going for so it, it's nice to see this all happening i know we're getting away from astronomy but the thing is at the end of the day it shows it, it was people like gene um, who really perhaps help spread the message we need to get out there. Mm-hmm. And we not only do we need to get out there, but we need to go there as a united planet and be not to be an, a nasty, aggressive little species, but mm-hmm. one that really wants to um, enjoy itself and perhaps learn and learn to coexist. Um, it, 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 was, it was great. Yeah, okay. This was also happening around the time of the Vietnam War. Yeah, imagination is a wonderful thing, Glenn. And I think in some respects, the imagination that Star Trek, shows like Star Trek, Space 1999, etc., gave us, and Andromeda, they keep the, the dream alive. Um, it, it's, it's not 
a universe of where oh we've got to be frightened and timid and not advertise our presence let's get out there let's advertise our presence let's tell everybody we're coming to talk we want to meet you um we're coming uh, to talk and conquer dun, dun, dun. yeah if it's the mirror universe yeah that's what they did <laughs> um but as i say the whole thing is it, it it did give hope. It gave hope in a very troubled time. And it gave people who were in school and in college the desire to go and work on things like the, the space program, on, on stuff like SETI, on modern telescopes and radio telescopes. Hey, mm-hmm. I'm just glad you could make it. I think it worked quite well because nowadays it seems like there's a lot of space and pe- empty space in people's heads. There is, yeah, because what have we we haven't got anything <laughs> really as entertaining and as dream building. I think the only thing you could say that was entertaining was the Orville. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, uh, that 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 was really a, 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 a Mickey taking the Star Trek. Yes. So yeah, it, it's nice. It's fun. Uh, it's hilarious. Uh, and to some degree, it's still, yeah, it's still giving the same message. We're, hey, we're coming out here to make friends. But if you're going to pick on us, we'll pick back. Dude. But anyway, um, um, we're getting complaints in the chat room. <laughs> no, we're not. Well, one person did. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't count as complaints. Okay, so that doesn't, okay, fine. No, but seriously, um, it gave people like uh, Phil Colander, who did uh, Beagle, the, de- the desire to send a space probe to Mars, it gave people like Stephen Hawking the desire to succeed. Um, but what can you do if it plants an idea in, in, into young people's minds that they can do this, that there is a future, and that they can make it happen? Mm-hmm. Then they're going to do it. Musk is doing this. Bezos is doing this. Both of them admit that they're, they're, that they're using. Fo- Musk is using funds from his I, I can get you into orbit cheaper than than Delta can. So he's making money hand over fist and he's putting it into his big freaking rocket. They've actually they've already started expanding the Texas test facility right. rocket so they can actually start maybe throttle up the engines properly to full power. They can't yeah. do that at the moment. The facility isn't capable of doing it. But mm. He's actually pushing He's actually taking money with his board's agreement, uh, and he's putting the money into do it into making the facilities available. He wants to go to Mars. Uh, yeah, I would love to go to Mars. I want to. All right, I want to go back to the moon first. I want us to prove our technology in the local neighborhood. Then we can push out. We can go to Mars. We can go to the asteroid belt. We can think about having a long cruise to Jupiter, Saturn. Maybe we can build a spacecraft that can do a multi-year. Um, journey right to the edge of the solar system mm-hmm. but un- unless unless we get um, ourselves out of low earth orbit we're not going to get anywhere and that is the biggest hurdle biggest problem we've had everybody's been happy it's fluffy bunny land this to go to earth orbit low earth orbit going into high earth orbit and going beyond back to the moon going to mars is yeah okay maybe next year and it gets pushed back maybe in two years three years five years but you know what? These guys who are investing commercially in space are saying, hang on a minute. If we keep doing this, it's going to be 100 years before we get to Mars. We ain't going to hang around for this. We are going to get off our backsides. We are going to put the money. We're going to build the systems. And you can come along if you want. If you want to be a partner, fine. You can chip in. But we are going to go whether you want to or not. Uh, and by having their boards back them in this, Steve Bezos is, is using the profits from Amazon for blue wild blue yonder and that is a great thing to do because he, he knows there's money out there to be made one way trip now nah, I, I would much rather um do a two-way trip do, do the grand tour of the solar system yeah mars without rad protection and gravity is going to be suicide but then again human beings adapt we're one of these interesting species we have a thing called Evolution. Uh, it, 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 no short-term evolution, be, like be going between here and Mars, hoping to you know evolve so you don't get zapped by radiation. Though but the thing is, that's it, not going to happen. It's, it's going to happen over a lot. It's going to take a long while. Yes, mm-hmm. but it will happen. People, the people who go to Mars to start the colonies, their kids, their grandkids, their great 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 grandkids will evolve to become the Martians. Because they will adapt eventually over a long period of time 
to the planet. And if it gets really bad and the solar storms are terrible, you go underground for a while. You go into the bunkers. Depends. Well, well, if you could survive the trip there, that use that technology once you get there. So there's no underground during the trip. So no, they would have to come up with some technology before, you know, for the trip. So underground would not be like the total option if they have some some uh, way of getting past all the radiation to get there. So uh, really won't have to go underground. Well, as I say, they're talking about making parts of the spacecraft from uh, plastic because the biggest issue is, of course, when radi- when solar radiation hits the metal, you get um, you get particles zinging off um, alpha, beta, and gamma through the metal. Mm-hmm. Now, if you've got a, a plastic area that's got water and it's sandwiched between the two layers, then that does uh, that has been found to provide some protection. Mm-hmm. Now, the other great thing is if you're going to build a spacecraft like a Tupperware, okay, let's call it a Tupperware spacecraft for argument's sake. You're going to build it in space. It is always going to be in space. I'd build it in the oceans. Plenty of plastic there. <laughs> hey, recycle the plastic. There you go. Collect it. Recycle build some, it. Build, build a spaceship with it. Yeah. Yep. It's already thing, right there. Just go floating. But the thing is, it's never going to be a spacecraft that's going to survive reentry. Yes, you can carry orbiters. Um, or landers that can go down and come back up, bring your crew back up after the away mission, and and do it that way. That would be a great thing to do. So you have a predominantly plastic spacecraft, and it's going to be a case of you have something which is relatively not going to cause secondary radiation to fly off around the spacecraft. That was the big thing. When you when when cosmic rays hit a metal spacecraft you get the, the spray of particles afterwards. And some of those particles, are, all right, alpha and beta will stop fairly, alpha stops at the skin and beta stops just under the skin. But gamma doesn't. Gamma goes right through. And that's, uh, that is what causes a lot of problems. So by keeping the amount of metal down on your spacecraft to where it isn't going to be in an area where the humans are going to be effective, you can probably build habitats for using solar storms. Mm-hmm. Glenn is referring to stranger in a strange land. Who knows what would happen, Glenn? I grok it. I'm sure you do too. Sorry, I had to set that one in. <laughs> but seriously, these are all hurdles we have to face and we have to beat. But it will happen. Why? Because people want to do it. And at the end of the day, they want us to stop being a one planet civilization and become a multi planet. Uh, Twisted Edge is suggesting build O'Neill cylinders and live in orbit. We could, we could okay, let's go one, let's go one step further. Let's build something like Rama, park it in a Lagrange point, and have that as a new home as well. So you could have that as a place for the astronauts, cosmonauts, taikonauts, call them what main, you like. Thoughts. Your main meal could be ramen soup. Yeah, there's always that option. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, I, I saw that one coming. <laughs> <laughs> But at, at the end of the day, the thing is, if there's a will, there's a way, as they say. And these guys have a way, have, have a will, and they want, they'll want to build the way very soon. They don't want to be stuck um, on Earth. And to be honest, if we stay on Earth and we don't have space technology and space travel, we're just going to go the way of the dinosaurs. What killed the dinosaurs? Well, apart Politics. from objects falling from space and the other one of course was they didn't have a space program there you go but everybody probably, thinks that's a joke but there's a lot of because truth. probably because they didn't have thumbs well this is true but the thing is one of the important requisites for survival um from a from an incoming catastrophe like a large chunk of rock a comet is the fact you would have a, a working space travel system that would allow you to perhaps get out there if you can detect it far enough out. You can perhaps nudge it into a slightly different orbit and then perhaps not have to worry about it for another 20 years. Well, if dinosaurs had thumb, thumbs, they could have hitched a ride by a passing spaceship. That. Yes, and they could have had towels and babel fish too. Exactly. There you go. But no <laughs> no thumbs and what was it get you? 65 million years later, then we started heading into space. Yeah. The slow way. So, but no, seriously, that's a, that's I, 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 I know this was a comment that was made, um, I think, by Gene Shoemaker, and I think David Levy made it as well. Without a space program, we're doomed. 
We're dawned because yeah, not really. the simple fact is we can't do anything about anything that's coming in. We can only try to ride out the impact. Mm -hmm. Well, the great thing about SpaceX is they, they have cut the cost of putting stuff into orbit. And because they've done that, a lot of people, a lot more people, are now shifting their business from um, Boeing Delta over to SpaceX because he is he has a very good system. It is very reliable. He's recycling parts of his spacecraft, and he's even started uh, drop bringing the fairings home as well now. Mm -hmm. So he's actually because of the recycle capability. He can, he can afford to undercut people like Delta who cannot recycle their rockets. It's a one, one use, that's it. So, yeah, they, they charge the big bucks. I think Aqua made a comment, a question, and I think he, he might have the answer. He's, Aqua says, the question is, did dinosaurs have starships? You know, that could have been it. Dinosaurs had starships. They saw the big one coming. They had a space program. They left. They let it hit. And Man that's why. The earth. <laughs> that's why. The, that's why there's no dinosaurs here. Not that they got wiped out by the big one, but they actually had a space program and they left. So, no problem. Do so you, you now say, know that you are actually looking, paraphrasing a Doctor Who story? No, am I really? That the dinosaurs Silurians. left. Doctor Who and the Silurians. Oh, okay. And the the one of the interesting things. Sorry, Silurians. Silurians. Salorians, Saurians. Well, I'll yeah. look it up. Okay, so the I'll premise was Salorians were an intelligent were an intelligent reptile. They um, was there were several different species. The dinosaurs we know from history, the Rex, the Diplodocus, uh, etc., were all kept by them. They kept uh, they had their own gene banks and everything else, and they were also a space traveling species. But I said that was just the Doctor Who version. What would have happened if the dinosaurs had had a chance to develop and mature? There was a lot of people who thought that if dinosaurs had developed, had um, evolved, they may have evolved intelligence. They may have evolved technology. Um, some people even played around with some of the um, photo fit stuff and evolved uh, some of the plant eaters in that were erect. Um, standing, and they figured that the brain cases, the brains may have actually grown and expanded over millennia if they hadn't been lost. Cool. So there's always that possibility if there hadn't have been the disaster, the, the, the KT boundary, um, it, it's, it's more likely they could have perhaps evolved, and we would be still primitive mammals. Cool. Who knows? We're, we're never going to know because we know that that hunking great piece of rock slammed into Chicxulub and it basically created a nuclear winter mm -hmm. but at the end of the day that, that's the way the cookie crumbles as they say that's what history tells us yep so so it, it might have been it might have been bullying that ended the dinosaurs too so see that that line right there I dare you to cross it that's a KT <laughs> line I dare you to cross that come on come on kid you cross that line and see what happens yeah nice that's, nice that's what happens they got bullied brilliant. They got bullied into extinction. We should do a little station identification. Yes, I think we should. All right. Here we go. Believe it or not, you're listening to the Event Horizon here on astronomy.fm radio. It is uh, now a little bit past 9.30 in the evening for those of us here in the eastern portion of North America. It is May the 4th, as I said before, be with you. Uh, 2018. Uh, Universal Time puts it at about uh, 1.30-ish in the morning, Saturday morning, uh, May the 5th, 2018. So we still got another half hour of programming uh, live, but don't forget we'll repeat this program every four hours for the next 24 hours. Okay, let's put, some, let's put a link into chat. Um, I know you did the sun, and I know there's a, a corona hole which may cause us some Brief flickers in the sky. Yeah, yeah. Really, really lucky. Potential G1 magnetic storm coming our way, but uh, not going to be that much of a storm anyway. So, and of course, yeah, uh, if, no you, if, if you're in Iceland, it's it's the land of the midnight sun. It is. <laughs> Nothing so, kills aurora better than than sunlight. Yes, okay. which is where it comes from. So isn't that something? 
Yeah. Okay, so keep a watch on the changing patterns Venus makes with its background stars from week to week. As Adebron and the Pleiades sink away, Beta Turi, El Nath, above Venus closes in. Summer is seven weeks off, but the Summer Triangle is making an appearance in the east, one star after another. The first in view is Vega. It's already shining low in the northeast as twilight fades out. Next up, of course, is Deneb. Um, Lower left of Vega by about two or three fists at arm's length. Deneb it takes about an hour to appear after Vega does. That really depends on your latitude. The third is Altar, which uh, sl- shows up far to the lower right by midnight. As dawn begins on Saturday, uh, May the 5th. May the 5th be with you. Uh, the Cin- the Cinco, de, Cinco de Mayo. Yeah, Cinco de Mayo. So if you're in Brazil, Argentina, everywhere else, enjoy Cinco de Mayo. Um, so as... Dawn begins on there. The waning gibbous moon shines between Saturn and Mars. And, of course, uh, Jupiter's great red spot will cross the meridian, central meridian around 11.56 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Now, the Eta Aquarius meteor shower, I know you covered this, Marty, because I saw the links. <laughs> That's okay. Go for and, it. And uh, should be active before the first light of dawn Sunday morning. Mm-hmm. It's normally the best shower of the year for the Southern Hemisphere. But us northerners, we have a poor view of it. Moreover, uh, the light of the waning gibbous moon will interfere. Sunday, the return of the 6th, May the 6th, the moon will shine with Mars. Um, Now, here's a challenge. With Jupiter two days from opposition, it's currently casting its shadow in space almost exactly away from us, but not precisely so. An eclipse of Io tonight offers a test at 1.35 a.m. EDT. 10.35 10.35 p.m. PDT, Io disappears into eclipse by Jupiter's shadow. While hanging smack on Jupiter's western preceding edge, um, in your telescope you can detect that Io fades out just barely off Jupiter's limb rather than behind the limb itself. Monday, um, last quarter moon tonight, exactly at 10.09 p.m. EDT. Now, the moon rises at around 3 a.m. daylight savings time. By early Tuesday morning, it's far to the left of Saturn and Mars. Um, From the northern hemisphere. From the northern hemisphere, yes. Far to the right from the southern hemisphere. Tuesday, May 8th, Jupiter is opposition tonight, opposite the sun as seen from the Earth, and about its closest and brightest for the year. So if you look at the Sky and Telescope May edition on page 48... You can see it in their telescopic guide. Wednesday, Arcturus is the brightest star very high in the east these evenings. Spiker shines about three fists at arm's length to its lower right. Um, to the right of Spiker, by half that distance, is the distinctive four star constellation of Covus, the springtime crow. Apparently, I've just been told there is a picture of circulating on the internet of Buzz Aldrin wearing the Infinity Gauntlet. Oh, nice. Yeah, okay, so. Where do you go to Wednesday? Um, yes, far below Arcturus, Jupiter glares. Uh, Thursday the 10th, uh, springtime nights, the long dim sea serpent Hydra snakes along the along level, far across the southern sky. Find his head, a rather dim asterisk about the width of your thumb at arm's length, in the southwest. It's lower right a regulus by about two fists at arm's length. Also, a line from Castor through Pollux points to it at about two and a half fists away. Lower left of this is Hydra's heart, orange Alfred. Hydra's tail stretches all the way to Libra in the southeast. Hydra's star pattern uh, from forehead to tail tip is about 95 degrees long. In the early mornings of Friday, the asteroid 472 Roma should occult a 10.8 magnitude star in Serpens, Capunt, for telescope users along a path from Northern California through Georgia. There are plenty of charts available on the Sky and Telescope website. And that brings us back to Saturday. And three zero-magnitude stars shine after dark in May. Arcturus high in the southeast, high above Jupiter. Vega much lower below in the northeast. And, of course, Capella in the northwest, upper right of Venus. They appear so bright because at least each of them is at least 60 times as luminous as the sun and because they're all relative nearby, 37, 25, and 42 light years from us, respectively. Speaking of Capella, Capella, between Capella and the, the fish hook in Perseus, there's a star, 16th magnitude. 
you know, I know you're balking right now. Say, well, well, it actually got as bright as six magnitude, starting to fade a little bit down to seventh magnitude, something like that. It's a nova in Perseus. Yeah, it it uh, went ten magnitudes of a brightness change. What's that? Like a thousand times of brightness change. Pretty amazing. So if you get a chance to Northern Hemisphere observers, it's pretty low in the uh, northwestern skies after sunset, and then it'll dip really low um, near the horizon. Might even go below the northern horizon for a little bit, and then pop up back in the early, in the early mornings uh, in the northeast. So if you can. Look for information on the star. It's in the uh, AAVSO, American Association of Variable Star Observers. Um, they've got coordinates for it. So if you get a chance this weekend, go look for that star. It's, like, it's a rather unusual nova. And if, and if you can find it, it's like it's a good observing challenge, something that you probably haven't seen before is a, a nova. And this one, if you keep watching it um, week after week, you'll see it fade and eventually disappear from your view because it'll go back down to about... 16th magnitude unless it happens to flare up because you never know what this one it kind of goes up and down but this is like the brightest it's i think ever gotten uh 10 magnitudes brighter than what it usually sits at so this is kind of an unusual one. So you got a chance to see a rather almost supernova but not quite nova jupiter on um on uh what was i going to say opposition Got an unusual event. Uh, this is one I've always I always touted, and I've only been able to see it once or twice. Uh, one of its moons, Europa, is actually going to pass its shadow, and that can only happen at opposition. So this will be visible from the west coast of North America, um, Hawaii. Now, west coast and Hawaii would be like uh, kind of late in the eve, uh, late in the morning. Before, before sun rises. But the best place is everywhere from uh, uh, Australia up through Indonesia into Japan. Uh, you'll first see the shadow start to uh, go across the face of Jupiter. But only one minute later, Europa will fall right behind it. And then as it goes along, Europa will actually pass its own shadow. So that what will come out will be Europa first and then its shadow. This only happens at opposition. you got one chance to see it uh, once a year if it happens at all. Sometimes there's, the moons are just not, not lined up for that to actually happen. So this, this time you got a chance to see that. So uh, that's opposition May the 9th uh, for everybody west, west side of uh, North America and uh, western Pacific Ocean has a chance of actually seeing this. be pretty cool to see it. Uh, it's going to be below the horizon for for me here in Michigan, so no chance at that one. It's going to be below my horizon at the moment, too. Um, now, of interest to people who do photometry, uh, a beta release of Astron Astromica has, that can work with the Gaia DR2 is now available for download on the Astromica website. Um, and that is www.astrometrica.at forward slash beta, Astrometrica or Astromica dot zip um, so if you're interested in playing with the Gaia details uh, that Gaia data something to download and play with I've actually got this program uh, every now and again I, I really feel that I have to go put some of my images in from my favorite radio of my favorite radio tests my favorite optical telescopes uh, and just play with it and see what I can do um, I am considering doing some of this this could be interesting be so they, they did do an upgrade for Gaia DR1 and of course, this the new version will also report the color band for comets rather than uh, the nuclear the N for nuclear magnitude in the M MPC report file. So go and have a look at the list and uh, see what you think and uh, get stuck in. I think this is probably the, we're going to get tons and tons of petroflops of data coming in now. SKA is being upgraded. Um, the Merlin interferometer as being up, updated and everything else all the big scopes are literally going through upgrades including LIGO um, I think most of the LIGO systems are currently offline they're being updated they're getting new more precise measurement equipment installed and tested which is great um, uh, as I remember there was a new accelerator that came online in Japan uh, for antimatter uh, investigation i think that was reported in symmetry.com 
So it is going really to be an interesting time. And citizen science is really coming to the fore, to the floor, because we are the guys who can task our computers, sit there morning, noon, night, to just chew up, chew through the data and report it once it's uh, been processed. So we really do have an opportunity. And, of course, the really great thing about citizen science, as I will tell you, you get your name on the paper. Yes, you're going to have the principal investigators up first, and then they're going to list everybody. They have to. It's a legal requirement because the, basically you're, you're the person that's done the work. They have to give you a mention on the papers. Now, you can do this through um, places like Galaxy Zoo, um, or you can get into the various projects that bio, use Bionics out of Berkeley. But do it. Have a bit of fun. And I, I, I get emails from academia. Uh, com now saying just letting you know Nick there's now X number of papers with your name on it we found X Y and Z paper. I've had about five emails uh, I think um, my count for papers is up to about 20 papers with my name on it so I'm not doing too badly in that aspect I'm thinking hey this is great my name's on those papers who would have thought that but that's, that's the, the nice thing about citizen science um, even if you're just processing images and stuff uh, for, for NASA when they come to write the papers, because they're using the image that you processed or the data you processed, they will credit you for it. So, yeah, the credit will be uh, information or copyright was credited uh, NASA processing by, and let's say, for example, um, Black Projects, Nick Yvette's, Marty Coons, and Starstorm. Depends how you put your name on the program. So, yeah, you, you get credited for everything you do. And I think this is a wonderful way to go. And, of course, uh, it, it is the way of the future. We get so much stuff coming down now from the, from the space probes, from other sources, that the lead scientists can only sample the data. They, they can't go into the, into the data. Oh, where's Stormy tonight? Uh, she's not feeling very good because of the weather. Um, so it's really a case of, they really, really need you. Um, so it's one of those things. That's a good point. I thought she'd logged in, but uh, I don't think so. we haven't got any links for that, the show. That's ah, <laughs> you have to go back. <laughs> I can only go back to a certain point where I got kicked out. Ah, uh, uh, we'll, we'll work on that after the show. Yeah. By the way, coming up tomorrow morning in nine hours, seventeen minutes. And 27, 6, 5, 4 seconds, uh, or something like that. We're not too sure exactly, but okay, about 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, yeah, that can't be right. 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, Mars Insight will be launching live coverage. So go to NASA Television, 7 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, North America Time. Um, about a half hour before that, they'll actually start start coverage. So Mars Insight being next probe going to the planet Mars, and it's going to examine the interior of Mars through uh, seismology. Seismology, yes, it's going to hum. <laughs> it's going to hum a few tunes, <laughs> and by that, they'll be able to tell what's inside of. Uh, off Mars, so that's kind of cool. Also, May 5th, two hours later, yes, just two hours, it's going to be an exciting uh, NASA morning tomorrow morning. The uh, SpaceX Dragon capsule will depart from the space station, so you can watch you can watch space all tomorrow morning. So, I shall be at work tomorrow morning. Uh, I just will try to get up and, and see the launch. Now, that's when it's scheduled. You know, it could always change that but that's when it's, the launch is scheduled now the departure will definitely happen uh very few glitches on a uh, um, departing space capsules for that so no problem there <laughs> uh the moon is starting to get into the sagittarius region so you can look for some uh moon covering some uh quite a few stars uh fourth third magnitude and and dimmer stars be hap happening the next uh well tomorrow morning actually so. Check that out. So, nice to see the moon down, and a lot of, it goes through a lot of stars in that area. Uh, let's see. Oh, we're talking about stuff asteroids we were talking about earlier. Ceres is still visible, but with 
um, what you call it, um, Orion new, new, setting in yeah. the you know, well, Orion's Orion's already pretty much pretty much set into the sunlight, but after that is Gemini. So uh, between the the two twin stars, Castor and Pollux, and Leo the Lion, you know, main star is Regulus, is a kind of dim constellation, Cancer the Crab, and that's where the former asteroid now dwarf planet series is at so you want to get a chance to look at a uh, a dwarf planet this is the time to do it and this is one of the brighter ones because it's it's only about six magnitudes so yep you can actually see it in a pair of binoculars true so now telescope's a little bit better um you have to kind of learn some stars in the field of view but get your viewing of uh dwarf planet former number one asteroid series well, you still can. And then after that, we're getting into the realm of the Virgo Galaxy Cluster and Coma Bernices, too. Tons of galaxies out there, and starting at about, I don't know, seventh magnitude, something like that. They're uh, really pretty easy to see several of them through binoculars. The bigger the telescope you have, the more you can see. <laughs> you just go from one galaxy to another galaxy. Sometimes you get two galaxies one field of view and then half a field of view away there's another galaxy so it's a great region to go uh, galaxy hunting so as we get more towards uh, well it's the early evening stuff so you don't have to worry about the moon right now kind of near last quarter so that won't be rising until about two in the morning so you get pretty much all the early part of the evening to go galaxy hunting through uh, Virgo constellation of um, Virgo and Coma Bernices too well, as I, as I say, Mar Marty's seen the picture because um, I've, I've been talking with my telescope guy and we're actually getting very, very close to actually having the setup I want. It is going to be a 20-inch dob. It's going to be go-to because it's going to have Argo Navis and uh, Servo Cat. But the thing is, I'm imaging. I'm, this telescope is not going to be for visual. It's going to be for images. Um, so what, he, what has been suggested to me and... Uh, I've, I've been ruminating about this, uh, um, what I want done on, what I want for the scope. So let me just pull up the suggestion that was made to me just for a second. So basically, oh, where is it? Where is that pose? There we go. Okay, so what's what's been decided is that I should have, a, it's going to be a hybrid dob, but it's going to have a full upper cage. Now, at 3.3 with a DSLR, um, we're like talking 9, 19, 20, 21, maybe 22 magnitude. Mm -hmm. If I stick an, uh, a hypercam, an Altair hypercam, um, or if I put, say, an S big onto it, we're, we're talking that I'm actually going to be getting down to something like 20, uh, magnitude 25. 25th mag that's now, that's faint it's usually combined but what total uh exposure time we're talking about for something like that if i'm using a ccd i'm probably going to be talking about a couple of minutes per exposure then doing all the all the darks and flats and but lights. now that would should, is a couple of minutes for one frame or a couple of minutes combined like five and ten second frames from what I understand, I, I'm, I, I use the DSLR. The last time I took an astro image, uh, personally, I used a DSLR. Okay. And it, it was a lunar image, and I was taking. Uh, yes, I know I need that black project, but I ain't going to get it. <laughs> um, come on, tell the chat room what, what our friend Guy has got for a camera, because I'm, I'm sure um, you probably remembered. Um, but the thing is, for me, I, I'm, I'm looking for comets. I'm, I'm really a comet guy. So I'm, I am looking for. For really, really faint comets that are making are beginning to make their way into the solar in a solar system. Yeah, if I can get a really nice bright one, I'm not going to bother with a CCD. I'm just going to slap the DSLR on it. So it's going to be a case of with a DSLR, we're talking minutes, um, and perhaps with the it's a multi K worth cam. Yeah, it's a multi thousand dollar cam he's got. Yeah. It's like, wow, it's, it's an impressive piece of kit. Um, but we're, we're talking probably, I, I would, the way I, I understand it, and I could be, I should be corrected if I'm wrong, but we're probably talking about 40, 50 second exposures. Mm -hmm. But it's got to have Servo Cat 
um, because I need to figure in rotation. Oh, that's right. With you a need dog, a, I have rotation. To you need a D rotator. Oh, that's that. That is simple because uh, it is going to be a case of that that uh, the actual focusing mount will have that ava- that set up so it can actually rotate as well. Mm-hmm. I, I'm getting the I'm, the moonlight suite. I'm looking at it's going to be electronic focuser, two motors. One to focus, one to rotate. Um, the 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 actual camera as the, the scope is moving. Now, if you're using an Etonian, is this rotation the rotation is not an issue. It is with a DOB, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. However, most of the time it will be lunar images. It will be DSLR time, so I'm not really worried about it. But I, I have the feeling I'm going to be having an awful lot of fun soon. <laughs> and it'll be like someone better call me before the show because I'll probably forget. <laughs> Particularly Friday nights and there's a moon out there. Uh, the, I'll be out imaging. For those that missed that about the D rotator rotator, when you have a telescope that moves up and down, right and left, that's called altazimut type of telescope. Um, the orientation of the view changes depending on what part of the sky that you're looking at. So let's, let's as an example, let's say if you put your elbow on the table and point your, your finger straight up and put, let's say you put your right elbow on the table and point down to your left. Okay. So that, that would be the North South line and then move your hand straight up and down. That's your North South line and then move your hand to the right. So as you can see the up and down, line actually changes so that if you have a telescope or a camera that's flat your north south line would actually be twisting in your view and your stars would, stars would move even if you're tracking so you actually need to turn the camera so that your due north line is at the top of the frame your due south line is at the bottom of the frame and as the telescope swings over from the east to the west it keeps the north south line aligned in your camera uh equatorial mounted telescope doesn't have to do that wherever you point it turn on the equatorial mount the mount actually moves your your whole camera so that it it moves it uh it keeps that line north and south line proper but um on a alt azimuth type of telescope when it goes up and down right and left uh the image actually twists in your field of view so you have to counter twist your camera in order to uh keep your stars from streaking now, Akko, for you asking me about how many uh, cameras, how many comets have I seen at the telescope? I don't visually, Im- I don't visually observe. Um, my eyes are such that I, I can't do it. Um, I need trifocals, a lot of the case. And even when I set it up um, for just my eyes, uh, I, I need a, uh, a binocular um, eyepiece. So, as I say, for me, it, it's much easier for me just to p- put it onto a computer screen and take my images and process them. At the moment, I'm learning uh, nebulosity. I am uh, going to be learning PixInsight as well, because between the two of them, um, I have pretty much the whole of the imaging ish, the whole imaging thing covered. Those are uh, imaging uh, processing software, computer program software. Yeah. Yes. And, and the really nice thing is, um, I think the only one that's really mega expensive is Pix. But having said that, having seen what you get for Pix. I, I, I can understand the cost. You get a heck of a lot of support. The, the guys who developed it are really there. So they want to know how many have I imaged? Yes. Um, probably about twenty. Today. I think I've seen about that many visually. Yeah. I photographed a few, but I've probably seen them. I have definitely seen a couple dozen visually myself. How many images do I have in my collection? I'm up at thirty-one thousand images taken and that that's comets that's the moon that's galaxy that's nebulae asteroids that covers the whole gamut of images i have about thirty-one thousand images well we've kind of come down to the end of our programming so just about time for us to get out of here i want to thank everybody that's been in our chat room tonight really appreciate you all being here um 
Thanks for everybody listening in. Don't forget, we'll repeat these programs every four hours, next 24 hours. So stay tuned. Keep listening in for more shows. This is Bozeman. This is the away team. To the beam up. Captain Savick, we're ready to come home. There you go. All right, everybody. Don't forget, tomorrow morning, watch NASA TV. Hopefully, uh, you'll see the launch. Time for us to get out of here. Good night, all. We hope that you've enjoyed this program from AFM Radio, the broadcast service of Astronomy.fm. This program has been released under Creative Commons license. Please contact us for details. You may find more of our AFM original programs on our website. It's really easy to find us. We are astronomy.fm. You may also find us in the iTunes radio listings near the top of the News Talk section and also as an iTunes podcast selection. We'd love to hear your comments. Please email us at radio at astronomy.fm. Thanks so much for being part of the voice of astronomy around the world and across the known universe. This is astronomy.fm radio. Hi, this is Tavi Greiner, Astronomy.fm's Vice President of Communications. If you enjoy our programming, please let us know with a donation to Astronomy.fm slash donate. We really do rely on your support, and it's true. Every little bit counts. AFM. There I was, doing my thing.